Brothers and sisters, it's good to be in the house of the Lord another day. And I certainly would want to say happy emancipation to all of you. And I'm sure those who have become a part of the fabric of the Jamaican society has made Jamaica their home, who may not have been natural Jamaican, but have made Jamaica their home, and have been celebrating these anniversaries for some time, would value these observations that we make. I heard a little uh, comment from a millennial, one who is between 18 and 35, they say, somewhere around there. They keep changing the number at different points. So we work with that today. Um, said that uh, those persons who are under 40 do not understand what independence and emancipation is all about. As far as they are concerned, it's two holidays in August. Uh, one on the first and the other on the sixth. There, there, there is no meaning outside of that for some people. Now, it may be true and it may not be true, but it's opportunities like these when we celebrate that we are able to remind the persons of the importance of what our forbearance went through and uh, what freedoms we have and celebrate today and which we are tempted to take for granted how we are enjoying this wonderful freedom. But I bear that in mind in terms of the emancipation and independence focus. I want to certainly thank the choir for that message in song and also I had to comment to to Deacon this morning, what happened to my stone? Did you say something? Yes. But I was wondering now if um, all the choir, and then of course, uh, Sister Tracy got jealous as well. Because we are up here and we don't have any stone. So it's part of the celebration that we should have our own stones as well. Uh, <clears throat> but I want to just share with you this morning, bearing in mind our theme about cultivating spiritual discipline. And the specific focus for today in this message, drawing on the passages which we read, I want to talk about disciples with benefits. Disciples with benefits. Very truly, and you heard the Jamaican version, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. You are looking for me not because you you are looking for me not because you saw signs but because you ate your fill of loaves. John 6 26. Let us pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We know your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. You have told us that your word will not return unto you void. And we take this very seriously, Lord. As we pause at this time to reflect on your word, we ask, Lord, that you will open the word to us, open our hearts to receive the word. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts find acceptance in your sight. Lord, we worship together in your name. Amen. Amen. 2011, there was a film that Hollywood produced called Friends with Benefits. It, had, it has popularized a particular practice that is known by persons, which is that persons can be in a relationship in which two people are physically intimate with one another, yet they are not committed to each other in any way. It's a relationship in which two people are physically intimate with one another, yet they are not committed to each other. My definition of that friend with benefits uh, experience is to have the appearance and the benefits of a committed relationship, yet there is no commitment. It is where people hang out together, get physical together, do almost everything together, yet they are just friends. There is no commitment, no future in that relationship, 
no strings attached. You know any relationships like that? Hold on to it. Just hold on. Let's think about it. Jesus was saying that people who follow me, who have no strings attached, who enjoy participating in worship, who receive financial benefit and privileges from the church, who receive services of the church as disciples, but are not interested in him as the main focus of that relationship are disciples with benefits. You see the difference? We're looking at that story that is very popular in our culture, friends with benefits. People connected, people hang out, people are physically intimate, but there's no commitment. And Jesus is saying that people who follow him, that people who, are in, who participate in even worship experiences, who participate in the life of the church, but who have no commitment, who are just friends. No commitment are not any different from those who are participating in a friend with benefit relationship. We want to talk about disciples then with benefits. And what are some of the limitations of this kind of relationship and what Jesus offers as not so much disciples with benefit, but disciples with commitment. Where did Jesus come from with this thought? Let's follow this story. How did Jesus get here? Jesus had just performed a miracle. And in this miracle, a whole group of people had gathered to listen to him preach. And it was getting late. And so Jesus decided, he asked that he had to find some food for the people. So he asked the disciples if they had anything, and Philip, who lived in the particular area, the one who basically responded, says, yes, Lord, we, we have plenty of people here, but the amount of money it would take for us to buy food for all these people would be about six months' wages. About six months' average wage it would take to buy food for over 5,000 people. So can you imagine... So why are we talking about that? Jesus said, okay, what do we have? And they found a bar with five loaves and two fish. So Jesus told them to bring it to him. Jesus blessed the five loaves and the two fish, and he gave it to the disciples, and they distributed to all the people. And not only that, everybody ate and was satisfied, and they were able to pick up 12 baskets full of fragments after they had eaten. What a miracle. But Jesus performed that. So after that, Jesus talked to the persons, talked to the people who were there, but there were a group of people who said, no man, this man is ordinary. If he can perform this kind of miracle, if he can feed 5,000 people with what is equivalent to six months wage, this man is a good man to have around. So what they tried to do was to try to force Jesus to become their president. Force Jesus to become their prime minister. Force Jesus to become their leader. Because Jesus is good. He can provide food. And if he can provide food, he is the man we want. Jesus just take away himself. Because Jesus said, you know something? This is not the kind of leader I want to be for you. So Jesus disappeared into the mountains. He went into the mountains to reflect with the Lord. So while all of that was happening, the disciples noticed that Jesus was not coming to him. So they decided to take a boat and proceed to the other side of uh, to, to Capernaum. So I'm looking for the map now. Um, you can right. So in this map, if you get up, I said I don't know how to point it from here, but uh, on the northern side of the map, that big dot. Is where, uh, is where Capernaum is. And further down, Tiberias is where the miracle took place. So Jesus was at Tiberias. That's where the miracle took place. And so he was now going to the other side of the lake. And usually people commute and they stop at the towns and they do so by boat. So the disciples went without Jesus. And so when they reach about, it's about six miles from Tiberias to Capernaum. So while they were going north, about four miles up the road, or on the sea, they saw Jesus coming, kind of dark, dark now, walking on the water. Jesus was coming to us. They were afraid. And I'm telling you all that is in John's gospel. You read it when you saw it was read. Uh, we, we didn't cover all of this, but I'm just giving you what came before what we read. So he went 
along and the disciples, they were afraid and they saw Jesus walking on the water coming towards them. And Jesus told them, don't be afraid. And he invited them uh, to be, he went with them. So when they were up there, the following day, the other people who are still down in Tiberias, they realized that Jesus had not entered any boat to go north. They realized only the disciples had left. So they saw some other boats coming down and they didn't see Jesus or the disciples. So they decided to take a boat and go up to Capernaum to see if they could find Jesus. So it is why they were coming to Jesus now that they said to Jesus, so Jesus, how you got here? Jesus just did not to answer their question. You know, Jesus has a way of not responding to the question that you ask, especially if he thinks the question is superficial, especially if he thinks the question is not the real issue, especially if he thinks the question is not what you should be concerned about. They are asking Jesus, so how you got here? You fly? You run? You walk? You swim? You, you, because we didn't see you going in the boat. So how come you got here? Jesus said to them, you know why you're searching for me? You are searching for me. Not because you're really interested in the signs that I perform, but because you ate your belly full. Or in the Jamaican expression, you have your belly full. You are filled up. You are satisfied with food. And you want more food. That's why you follow it. So Jesus is saying, you are disciples with benefits. You are disciples coming after me. But all you want are the benefits that are coming. Disciples with benefits. Jesus was able to cut through what they presented. He was able to cut through their action. He was able to see beyond the presenting problem and saw or the presenting issue and saw their motive. He saw their motive. Jesus said, Your motive is suspect. He went beyond the question which was superficial to the real issue of why they were seeking him. He says, your motive is suspect, it is distorted. You are following me, yes. And the impression to be given that there is genuine interest, but the motive is not good. You seek me only for a change of loaves and fish. You seek me not only for physical food, but for physical service. You want to make me king. You want to help me so I can give you food again and again and again. You see what Jesus saw? They were looking at someone who was a food provider. And this was the qualification that they had of a good leader. One who could give them things. One who could deliver the goods. And so they were following Jesus. Because he was one who could provide the service. He was one who could deliver the goods. He was one who could provide the food. Jesus says, wrong motive for following me. No disciple who is worthy saw follows me only for that kind of service. You want to pull me into your service as a political leader, but that's not my mission. That's not what I've been called to do. You want me to serve you, to fill you. You want me for the benefit. The real intent of John's message, or John is the gospel, talks about sign. The other disciples, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, talk about miracles, but John talks about signs. So for John, the real intent of this message was to show that Jesus is the one who offers the real food that satisfies the soul. Jesus is the one that offers the real food that satisfies the soul, that satisfies the real hunger of men. When you are filled with Jesus, who offers the real food that satisfies the longing, deep hungering of men, you don't need nobody else. I need to say this at the beginning. The real point of John's message is to say that Jesus is the one that satisfies the soul. He's the one that satisfies human longings. Whatever your search, whatever your quest, wherever you go in search of something more or what you consider something better, John is saying that Jesus is the one that satisfies human longing, human need, human aspirations, human cravings. However you are searching for this, whatever package you use for this search, it cannot 
being satisfied outside of Jesus. Are you with me? That's what Jesus is saying. So, I want you to understand then that Jesus is able to discern our motives. This is about motive, Jesus is saying. And disciples with benefits is about motive. It's having the wrong motive. You need to discover what motive it is when you're following Jesus for the benefits only. When you're a disciple who's seeking benefits. Jesus is able to discern our motives. There's nothing new and radical in that thought. We all know that. We all know that Jesus can determine what is our position. We all know that Jesus can determine whether we are standing for what is truth or we are standing for what is false. We all know the problem is not that Jesus can do it. The problem is do we internalize that and accept that Jesus knows our motives. It is for us to get to that point where we acknowledge that Jesus knows our motives. He knows what it is that we are thinking and why we do what we do and why we follow him. God places his searchlight in our lives constantly. Brothers and sisters, God is constantly examining our lives. God has constantly placed a searchlight in our lives so we can find out, we can know what is our motive for being disciples of Christ. And each of us, from time to time, we need to pull back and ask ourselves, what is my motive for being a Christian? What is my motive for being a disciple? What is my motive for following Jesus? In the discussion with the woman of Samaria, Jesus discerned where her faith and passion were. In talking with that woman, Jesus had a conversation. This woman was talking about water. Jesus asked her for some water to drink. The woman said that I don't have anything to take the water. And Jesus said, the water that I shall give you shall spring up in you, shall well up in you like a river flowing. The woman said, give me that water. And in the discussion, they were talking about so many things, about what is true, about where they must worship. Jesus discerned that this woman was really just pulling him aside and just trying to see if he could get Jesus to follow her particular position or her understanding of what her forefathers had accomplished in their midst. Jesus discerned her intention. In Mark chapter 2, 1 to 9, 1 to 12 and verse 9, you can note it and read it later. Four men had a friend, a found a friend who was crippled. They took them to Jesus. They took, they took the man to Jesus who was in a house preaching. And they removed parts of the roof and lowered the man to Jesus. And Jesus said, Your sins are forgiven. And Jesus discerned that they were arguing among themselves. Is who this man? That he can even forgive sins? Jesus recognized that they were raising the question, that they were wondering. And Jesus said, you decide whether you want me to say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk. Which is easier. And so Jesus was making the point whether one could forgive sins or, or not. Jesus deserved their intentions and their thoughts. I want to say, my brothers and sisters, that the gift of discernment is given to the church as well. We are in a position where we can discern. And that is why when we have, for example, candidates who are being prepared, who are being received into the fellowship, that is the specific and awesome task of the leaders who meet with them. The leaders meet with them to discern their commitment. The leaders meet with them to discern their faithfulness. The leaders meet with them to discern what it is that they desire. And whether they are disciples with benefits or they are disciples who are following Jesus for the commitment that they have made to him. Are you with me? This is the responsibility of the discerning members. No, don't get me wrong. Jesus said, let the wheat and the tears grow together until they are harvest. Because sometimes even when you discover once you start to pluck up, you're going to pluck up. When wheat and tears grow together, you're going to find that the roots are so intertwined that when you pull up, you're going to pull up the wrong things. 
So there is still strategy in doing so. But when we cultivate spiritual disciplines, what do I mean by that? When we wait on the Spirit, when we pray earnestly, when we read the Word, when we get into the Word and we allow the Word to get inside of us. We not only read the Word, you know, but we allow the Word to get inside of us. I believe every one of us read the Word every day. Hmm? I believe every one of us read the Word every day. If we don't go to it in the Bible, we go to it on one of the social media programs that either somebody send a Bible reading to us every day, either in voice or in words, and we listen to some of it, and if it's too long, we only listen to part of it. Yes. Are you out there? Yes. But we get it every day. We get something either from that or we have our own devotional guide. But we listen to the word. The question is not what we listen to. The question is what we allow to come into us and change us. That is cultivating spiritual discipline. It is to take the word and thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against thee. You can't be able to stand up against sin and overcome unless you have hidden the word in your heart. So when the temptation comes, I find in my own life as a disciple, times when I'm most vulnerable, times when I'm weakest, weakest, is when I have not allowed the word of God to take root in my life. Those are the times when I'm most vulnerable. Those are the times when I'm most unguarded. But when the word of God constantly takes root in my life and I allow the word of God to remain there, and to act on my life, I am more responsive, I am more attuned, I can balance my judgment with an evil heel. My brothers and sisters, this is what we're talking about, spiritual discipline, so that we can not only be disciples with benefits, which we don't want to be, we want to be disciples with commitment. Jesus is able to discern, but not only to discern, Jesus is able to declare our position and our motive. Jesus discerns it and Jesus declares it. Jesus said, this is where you are, you are following me for the wrong reason. Some people would say, Jesus is tactless boy. Some of us would go around it a little and say, you know, we just wonder about your commitment and your interest that we haven't seen certain things or we wonder, you know, that's probably our style and our approach. Jesus said, listen, you are following me because you're very full and you walk on food. You get the point of the message? Jesus, he did not mince word. He did not print the statement. He did not print the declaration. He discerned it and he declared it. He says, this is it. He called a spade a spade. He just went straight to the heart of the people. He says, that is why you are coming at me. Your motive is related to what you have experienced. And what you have experienced is physical. And you are stopping at the physical level. You have not realized that there is a whole lot more to life than the physical. There is a whole lot more. But we are not recognizing it. You are looking for me because you want food, not fellowship. We all as disciples need to confront ourselves about our motives for following Jesus. We all need to patiently and lovingly confront one another about the sincerity of our the discipleship. When there is great following of persons, or when there is a great following, when people are, when people are just crowding out a particular place, when, when there are huge, massive crowds and massive following, it does not necessarily mean that the motive is right. The motive could be wrong. The fact that everybody is doing it, the fact that everybody is moving in the same direction, the fact that everybody wants this, the fact that everybody is believing this, it doesn't mean that they, are, they may not be wrong. We see a lot of that during the recent World Cup. Um, in, in, in Russia, football World Cup in Russia. A lot of people changed position when they decided that their team, their popular team, was not doing so well. I saw a little image on one of the social media with this man who was cheering a team. He had an Argentinian shirt and he was cheering. 
And the moment Argentina lost it, take off the shirt. I know which shirt was under that? Croatia. Just change. There are some people who, they just change. They don't like their, their wabanis. They don't like their church anymore. Or if something happens in their church, and they say, you know, everybody's going to this church down the road. Let's try it out. Or everybody's going to that church up the road. Let's try it out. Or everybody's trying this new religion. Let's try it out. Or everybody's trying this new uh, movement. Maybe it's a yoga movement. Let's try it out. In other words, let's try something different. Because what we are experiencing is not so good. And since everybody is moving in that direction, we need to move. It doesn't mean that everybody is right. It could be that many are wrong. All of these people are coming at Jesus. And I'm sure among the crowd, a little man may have said to one of the leaders, so where you all going? He said, we're going to Jesus because you know, it's the miracle that Jesus performed. Come on, man. said, okay, we're coming with you. The others were just following and they said, where are we going? Where are we going over to Capernaum? They're not sure, but they say, everybody's heading up to Capernaum, so where are we going to stay down here? Let us join them. Are you with me? Some people are followers out of curiosity. You know, curious. They want to know what is happening. They hear a sound and they peep out. They hear a sound and they look in the direction or sometimes not run away from where the sound is. They run to the direction of the explosion because they want to see what is happening. You ever driving sometimes and you're in the traffic and you notice all the traffic so slow. And you wake up and you say, there must be an accident down the road. There must be something. When you reach down, you realize the road clear. There's an accident on the side of the road. But everybody passed and looked for the accident and screw up the traffic. So instead of going on, moving on, and moving at a good pace, they pause it to people to look over to see what is happening and end up holding up the traffic as they go. Everybody is looking on. There are many people who may respond out of curiosity. So there are persons who come to church, who come to your church, who join a particular religious movement purely out of curiosity. Probably, probably we talk about uh, the wagonists or the superficial followers. But there are those who are genuinely seeking for truth. They are seeking. They want to know more about God. They want to know how they can be better disciples. Those who are seeking for truth, they come regularly and consistent because they are seeking. They want to find the truth. They are like the uh, Ethiopian, they are like the Ethiopian Chancellor of the Exchequer, the Ethiopian eunuch, who would ask Philip, or who Philip asked, do you understand what you are reading? They are seeking. They want to know the truth. They want to get some money so that they can improve their faith. So there are persons like that. There are persons who are following because they have made a real commitment and have decided to follow Jesus. These are not disciples with benefits. Like friends with benefits. They are not disciples with benefits. They are disciples with commitment. They are following Jesus. Because they have made a commitment. They are following Jesus because of who Jesus is. Because they realize that Jesus is the person who provides the food that can satisfy their whole being, their whole lives. Jesus is the person who satisfies their whole beings. So they are following Jesus. There is also not only great following, but there can also be great falling. You notice that there's a movement and after a while a whole lot of people just stop. And a whole lot of people just fall away. And a whole lot of people just stop coming and not participating anymore. Because the motive was not so right from the beginning. And sometimes the falling away is because there's a wrong motive. Because the commitment was conditional. There may have been a commitment, but the commitment was conditional. I will follow you if. I will follow you because I will follow you however when so and so happens or I will follow you until and when the until happens there is a falling away many of those there may be great falling away too because commitment was inconvenient as church we have to be deliberate in the preparation we make in helping persons to cultivate spiritual discipline 
Persons who read the scripture and who read the scripture with an intention to learn something so that what they learn can change their life. Not just to say to somebody, I read my Bible this morning and I read my Bible this evening. But they are reading with an intention to receive. So they would ask questions of the scripture, is there a command from the Lord that I should obey? Is there a truth I should lift up in my life? They will ask of the scripture, is there an issue which God has brought to my attention for which I need to make a confession? So when they read, they read, and they look for these things. They look for what God is saying through the scripture. That is why Jesus had to say, while these people who follow them, he says, listen, do not work for the fool that perishes. Don't follow me only for benefits. Don't follow me for the material rewards or the material conditions or the material reality or the material outcome. Do not focus only on the material. He said, do not work only for the material because the material is perishable. But what I offer is imperishable. Listen to Jesus' caveat and Jesus' command. This is what Jesus said to Satan. Remember what he said to Satan? According to Matthew 4 verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus did say he don't need bread enough. He didn't despise the material. So don't get me wrong. Jesus said that alone is inadequate for the human being. You see, we are God people. We are spiritual beings. We are not only physical beings. So even if our physical nature and physical desires and physical expectations are satisfied, we are spiritual beings. We are whole beings. Our soul is constantly reaching out to God. That is why David said, as the heart pants after the water brook, so my soul seeks after you, O God. Our soul is constantly reaching out. So that is what we need to remember. And so I want to move to my second major point. First, a question about motive. The second, uh, this one won't be as lengthy as that first one. The second th thing is about morality. It's a question of morality. When we follow Jesus with the wrong motive, it's a question of morality. When we follow Jesus with the wrong motive, it's a question of morality. Disciples with benefit, we become dishonest and deceptive. Are you with me? When we follow Jesus and we only want the material benefits, we are being dishonest and we are being deceptive. Why are we being dishonest and deceptive? We are giving the impression as if we are genuine followers. That's what we're doing. We are giving the impression as if we really love Jesus. We are giving the impression as if we really want Jesus to be part of our lives. I like this song. That, um, we sang this morning. We give you glory, we give you glory. It's you that I love. We follow in Jesus because it is you that I love, Lord. It is not the things. It is not the service. It is not the food. It is not the benefit. It is you that I love, Lord. Friends, I, all I want to say and appealing to us is that each of us need to make time that we really spend time with Jesus. When you look at the story of Martha and Mary, you get a good picture of the kind of devotion that Jesus is at. It is not saying, and I'm not judging Mary or Martha in this case, it is not saying that more, both of them were, didn't value Jesus, but Jesus commented on the part that Mary took. He said Martha was complaining about everything. Martha was busily doing everything. Busily doing everything. Like persons could be busy doing everything within the church, within the community, within a kind of faith group, busy doing all the stuff that nobody else wants to do, but not taking enough time to manage the soul. Are you with me? We need to take time to manage the soul. 
Because after you have done all that is required, you may end up being a castaway because you have cultivated the spiritual discipline required for your own personal growth. It is something I challenge myself daily. Sometimes I find I'm preparing a message and I'm preparing to give. It's a time I need to pull back. What I tend to do on a Monday morning for the week is that time that becomes my, uh, what my wife calls sharpening the saw moment. It is my sharpening the saw moment. I do this throughout the week, but that's a special time where I take to make sure that I am not getting dull. I am not giving, giving, giving and not pausing that God can speak to me. Each of us need to do that in our own lives because sometimes we realize it, we're walking with the Lord but the Lord is going to leave us. We are walking too slow or we're not paying attention but it's we alone walking because we are so engaged in doing the Martha activities that we lose sight of just being with Jesus. And there are times we just need to be with Jesus. No fuss, no noise. Just listen to what Jesus is saying in our lives. We need to develop that kind of discipleship. And so, it's a question of morality. The, this is a moral issue. We know it is not right. We know it is not good. That's why Jesus says, don't do it. Don't labor for the food that perishes. Don't lead people into believing that you are something when it is not true. Don't be content in only being a member of the church, but have no commitment to Christ. Hello there. Don't be content in only being a member of the church, but have no commitment to Christ. You know this is possible. It is possible that there is no commitment when you see the grace of God at work in your life and in your midst, you should not be so concerned about the material benefits being enjoyed that you, can, that you cannot just celebrate what God has done. This is what the people did. Look at the miracle Jesus performed among them. They were so taken aback by the miracle. They were so taken aback by the physical thing that they didn't understand the message in the miracle. It is the grace of God in operation in your life. That when one sinner comes to know the Lord, it is the grace of God at work. And when God is so good, when God's grace is expressed in that way, when there is transformation, when there is healing, the complaint should not be, so why do we only have one? The complaint should not be, so where the others are. The complaint should not be, so we are, why more don't come? The complaint should not be, the complaint should be, or the commendation should be, thank you God for your grace. Yes. Thank you God for your grace. Yes. We have to learn to reframe. We have to learn to rethink. We have to learn to understand it is not the benefits and the outcome. It is not the material. What is the spiritual? That is what Jesus almost worked for. He says, labor for those things that can't perish. Many of us spend a lot of time laboring for those things that might perish. Though. Jesus said, labor for those things. Lay up for yourself treasures where? In heaven. Not with NCD who making mega bucks in terms of uh, profit. I'm not saying it was not saved in NCB at all. Because we have NCB staff here, so I'm not saying it was not saved in NCB. No, and I'm not saying it was not saved with JNB and JNB. I'm not saying that. The point that I'm making is that this should not be where you place everything. There is something beyond the material. When deception is displayed towards God, you realize that we also display deception towards others. When we are dishonest towards God, we are also going to seek to be dishonest with one another and to deceive one another. And so it is important that we watch the motive of deception and dishonesty. It influences the way we relate to our neighbors. So our public offices are sometimes sought not to serve 
but for self-service. Me not calling any name. Me not calling any name. But sometimes public offices, when we have political elections and all of that kind of stuff, offices are sought for self-service. Not so much to serve. It is usually in the outworking of the decisions we see and the resignations and all of those things that it makes you wonder what was the motive. That's why when we have public servants, serving persons need to serve. I always remember that when I wear that cap as a servant of this church, as a minister of this church, God has called me to serve. Not to serve myself. God has called me to serve. People become used. Whenever we are not honest before God, what we end up doing is using people. Because we are deceptive and dishonest. And when they don't fit our agenda, we overlook them and discard them and dismiss them. We must not do that with people in no place at all. We also find in our society we tend to value people for their utilitarian value. We value people for what they can do to us. And so, you become somebody's friend when you can get some benefits for them. When you can no longer provide some benefits, when you are no longer a channel of benefits, you are not so valuable. But you are valuable when you have some political connection, or when you have some economic resources, but when those things don't matter, you don't have any value. Friends, you see how we value people, and sometimes within the church, we value people like that, that some people are more valuable because of their money value than because of themselves. God forbid that we should organize our church according to the friends with benefits mentality or philosophy. The desire for things more than God is idolatry. Did you hear that? The desire for things more than God is idolatry. These people were following Jesus for the things more than Jesus. They were engaged in idolatry. And isn't that one of the commandments? Thou shalt have no other gods beside me. They were Putting the things before God. To desire to get to have more, to desire to get to have more, could lead to ruthless self-seeking. That when we desire things, when we desire power, you know what that makes us? It makes us despots and tyrannical. When we want power at all costs. Sometimes we see this played out in relationships. Sometimes it manifests itself in abuse. It manifests itself in persons being discarded. It manifests itself in persons being rejected. When there is the seeking of persons, of the seeking of power, rather than God who offers power. We want the power. A lot of church leaders get entangled by this quest for power. We want power. So that we can do all manner of things with this power. Jesus challenged persons. Don't look only for those things which perish. Because Paul tells us that a lot of things we have. A lot of gifts will disappear. But he says what remains is love. I didn't hear the echo from him. What remains is love. When there is love, there is no abuse. When there is love, there is no taking for granted. When there is love, we value people for who they are, not based on what they can do or give to us. When there is money that is sought, we can end up being thieves and robbers. When there is prestige that is sought, we can end up with evil ambition. When we seek these things instead of God, we are distorted. Things must never be more valuable than God and the relationship he desires. Is there anything in your life, brothers and sisters, that you could not part with for God? God is calling you today. 
God is calling you to make a particular commitment to him. Is there something in your life that you couldn't give up, you couldn't part with to make that response? If you can identify anything, then that is an idol in your life. The, the third and final point I want to make. It's not about friends or disciples with benefits. It should be disciples with commitment or obedience. What does Jesus say? In verse 28, and I read that verse. Then they said to him, what must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. This is how you demonstrate what God is doing in your life. Obedience. Obedience to God. This is discipleship with commitment. Not discipleship with benefit, but discipleship with commitment. It is obedience. What must we do to perform the works of God? Believe in Jesus whom God has sent. Obedience. A life of faithful obedience to the person of Christ. That will change the character of our relationship from being disciples with benefits to disciples with commitment. Obedience to Christ makes a difference. There are so many things that militate against our obedience to Christ. We want to obey, but we find it is hard to obey because there are so many things which compete for our attention and interest. We have to decide that we are not going to let those things distract us. And I'm telling you, you know, that the devil is working overtime. That the devil interests turn up. That the devil is working beyond ours because the devil wants to arrest God's people. The devil wants to put more and more distraction in our way. The devil wants to conquer, to oppress and to hold because the mission of the devil is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It's one mission. One mission. So anytime you find that there is something that is distracting you, something that is pulling you away from total commitment and total obedience and total service, don't blame the internet. Don't blame you the time that you have. Don't blame the things around you. Don't blame transportation. Don't blame the traffic. In other words, don't blame those other things. Don't blame other people. Consider that you need to take responsibility. So there is a genuine, sincere desire to do the will of God. You need to acknowledge that Jesus is sufficient, my brothers and sisters. Jesus is sufficient to satisfy the hunger of the human soul. Jesus is enough. The feeding of the 5,000 is tangible evidence that Jesus is enough. Not more church. Not more money. Not more education. Not more insurance. Not more company or more involvement. It is all of these may cause us to miss what Jesus wants to do in our life. And so I conclude by pulling this together again. Jesus calls us to be disciples with commitment, not disciples with benefits. Not disciples who hang out with him. Not disciples who engage in regular Jesus stuff or church stuff. Not disciples who wait with Jesus, who serve with Jesus, who engage in all the Christian looking stuff, but who have no, who are only doing all of these things for the benefit they get from doing them, but whose service is void of any commitment to Jesus Christ. We have to examine our motive. Why do we serve? Why do we respond? It shouldn't be for any of these things. It should be because we love God. It should be because we have decided to put Him first in our lives. Because we could discover that we're following for the wrong motive. And that's a moral issue. When we follow for the wrong motive, there is deception and dishonesty 
and idolatry. So we need to follow for the right reasons. A call to obedience is what Jesus makes in our lives. Jesus is adequate. And I want to say on this pre-emancipation day as we meet, pre-independence day as we meet here for worship. On this day, when we are talking about maintaining and cultivating spiritual discipline as our theme for the month, I'm saying to us, my brothers and sisters, what God has called us to do is to be disciples in the world so that wherever we are, others will see the light of Christ reflected in our lives and we will become significant change agents. And if we want to change the rest of our society that is enchained in dishonesty, that is enchained in deception and idolatry, if we want to change the rest of society, we must let the change begin in us. When we allow the change to begin in our lives, we can work towards making that change as we share with our neighbor, as we tell our neighbor, Jesus has changed me. Amen. Let us bow our heads in a moment of quiet reflection. Lord, you have called us into fellowship with yourself. We thank you. Lord, we know sometimes that we have been drawn away and our faith gets a little weak. Our faith is threatened a little. And we sometimes become a little bit hopeless, a little bit frightened, a little bit troubled. And we sometimes allow the events of our culture, the events of the world, global economic realities, global climatic factors, global political issues, global movements in trade and migration, and changes in commodity prices and all of that. We sometimes allow these things to determine and define our future. And we sometimes feel safe when these things are going well and unsafe when they are not going well, forgetting that our lives are anchored in you. We sometimes, by what we do, give the impression as if you are not enough for us, that you can't satisfy our longing soul, and with that, all things, as you have told us to seek you first. Then the other things will fall in place. We sometimes lose our confidence that you are capable of doing that. And we follow you more for the benefits. Lord, deliver us from that kind of deception and dishonesty. Deliver us from that kind of idolatry. And place within us, Lord, hearts of obedience. Hearts of commitment. Hearts bent on following you. On serving you. So that we will become the kind of disciples you want us to be. Lord, hear our prayers. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I've chosen this song that we... It's a song that... very popular one. It's one of the... African American League of Spiritual. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. It's a popular song about children as well. So I'm sure the children.